Representative Kilmer to come and talk to our community about the many wonderful things that are sometimes happening in the other Washington. It's been an interesting first uh, beginning of this session, but we're very proud of him. Representative Kilmer is always focused on doing what's right for our region and particularly for our students and the people who live and work here every day. This is his fourth term and we're so excited for the things that we know he's working on. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm just going to turn over the microphone to Congressman Kilmer. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience too. I'm sorry about our technical difficulties. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how well this will work, but we'll do our best. Um, uh, and I want to apologize in advance. I got the crud, so I'm uh, I'm not going to shake anybody's hand, and I'll um, wipe this microphone in Purell when we're done. Enjoy your flow. Thanks so much for coming. Um, how many of you have been to one of my town hall meetings before? Oh, that's actually pretty good. Um, if you have, you'll know I always start um, by. Uh, if you want to go to the next page? Um, can you go to the next page? <laughs> Yay! I always uh, start with a picture of my kids um, in part because I think they're super cute. Uh, the superintendent mentioned um, a lot of my focus is just making sure we're doing right by our kids. And can we give it up for our superintendent? The great work so the one on the left, that's Tess. She's now nine years old. And the one on the right, that's Sophie. She's 12. Um, uh, when we wrap this up, you may see me running toward my car because she's got a cello concert tonight and I'm uh, in the rare position of actually being able to be home to watch that, so I'm going to try to take advantage of it. But probably the most common question I get is, dear God, why would anyone want to be in Congress right now when it's such a mess and you got two little kids? And my response is always the same, it's because it's a mess and i got two little kids and I actually care about what kind of country they grow up in. Frankly, don't want their future dictated by a completely screwed up federal government. I thought I would talk about. Um, are we okay, guys? Everything all right? Yeah. Is anyone else finding that that's moving up and down? And is my cold far worse than I thought? <laughs> know how this will work, but we'll do our best, you guys. So. I was going to focus really on two, uh, two areas. One, trying to get our government back on track, and two, trying to get our economy on track. And when we talk about uh, the state of things, um, uh, unfortunately, you've seen in Congress um, far too much, and in Washington, D.C. in general, far too much uh, bickering, far too much uh, uh, inaction, far too little progress. And that's probably most exemplified by what we've just come out of, which was the longest government shutdown in our nation's history. Um, it was uh, uh, long and it was incredibly damaging. Um, and if you want to move on to the next page, I'll just talk a, um, a little bit about the impacts of it. Um, uh, shutdowns are dumb. That's a legislative technical term. Um, but listen, this came at a cost of about a billion dollars a day to our nation's economy. Um, I was up in Port Angeles, I met with uh, uh, a hotelier up there who said um, it literally cost his business tens of thousands of dollars because the national park was closed and they just had a bunch of cancellations because people couldn't come and go skiing and hurricane. I'll take questions, let me just run through this. So my plan is to, I, I won't take more than 15, 20 minutes tops and then I'll take as many questions as I can get. And many of you know my background was working in economic development and before, before that working in business. No successful business would do what you just saw the federal government do. You know, when there was a management disagreement, no successful business would say, well, let's just shut down the business for four or five weeks, uh, not pay our employees, 
uh, while we work out the disagreement. They would say, no, let's act like adults, let's keep the lights on, let's pay people, and let's try to work out our differences. And unfortunately, that's not what you see happening in our nation's capital. Um, you want to move on to the next slide? Um, I think it's important, too far. Um, I think it's important to point out, can you go back or no? Can't go back. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is not a costless exercise. I think it's important to point out that people um, are not pawns in a game. Unfortunately, uh, um, I heard far too many examples of people just really getting hurt by this. I met with a group of federal employees out in Tacoma and uh, one worked for the Bureau of Prisons. She said, I beat back cancer last year, but I still have expensive prescriptions. Uh, my kids are in childcare. I still got to go to work, but I'm not getting paid. She said, what should I not pay for? Uh, last night, I was out in Westport at the Coast Guard station there. And, you know, to meet with men and women who are keeping our country safe and secure, and yet had to worry about their own family's financial security, that's not right, and that's not fair, and that was not their fault. Uh, I was yesterday with uh, the tribal council for the Quinault Indian Nation. As a consequence of the shutdown, it literally cost them millions of dollars. They had a timber sale that literally just needed one signature on a contract, but the signature they needed was a, a person who worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs who was on furlough. And as a consequence, they couldn't move forward with their timber sale. Um, I was up in Port Angeles, met with the group that runs the ski season, uh, the ski lift and the ski school on Hurricane Ridge. And uh, they said, we got $60,000 of fixed expenses. We've had $0 in revenue because the ski season is closed. And again, uh, that is just no way to run a railroad. So um, uh, my approach, if you want to move to the next slide. Um, my approach has been to uh, not just sit back and watch, but to try to take action to, to fix things. So uh, most importantly, the House just kept passing bills to reopen the government. And finally, yesterday, for the first time in five weeks, the Senate actually voted on something to reopen the government. Um, which is the the House had actually passed, as of yesterday, 12 different bills to reopen the government. And I'll, I'll point out, they weren't, uh, and I don't say this in a partisan way, this is just a statement of fact, they weren't Democratic bills with a bunch of uh, Democratic parties. They were bills that had passed out of the state Senate prior to the new, or the U.S. Senate prior to the new year with 90 or more votes. Uh, so these were bipartisan bills, and yet, unfortunately, they were stuck in the parking lot until uh, the shutdown was able to end. Um, beyond that, because of some of the impacts that we've seen, I sponsored um, some specific bills. So I was a co-sponsor of a bill called the Pay Our Coast Guard Act, because I just think it is dead wrong to not pay our Coast Guard. Um, uh, I sponsored a bill to provide some financial protections so that uh, those who weren't getting paid wouldn't face foreclosures or defaults on their financial obligations. Um, and then uh, perhaps uh, also very importantly, I was a co-sponsor of the bill to make sure that the workers who weren't getting paid were able to get back pay once the shutdown ended. And thankfully that bill was passed and signed by the president. Um, go ahead and click, oop. Nope, that's not it. No. Nope, keep going, keep going, please keep going. <laughs> Sorry, we got the wrong, wrong PowerPoint, but it's okay. We're, we're, it's all right, go back. Go back one. No? Back one more. Sorry, maybe that. It's okay. You know what? Well, hello. Okay, go backwards. Not forward, backwards. Sorry guys, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Keep going back. Back one more. There, stop. All right, thank you. We're really sticking the landing here, you guys. In all honesty, we should give it up for my team who's working on a Saturday to help us out. 
We have this very wonderful computer with the wonderful clicker, so I can do this myself. Unfortunately, none of it worked here. <laughs> so we're trying for you. Um, so let me just say, um, there's actually common ground to be had uh, on the issue of border security. Uh, there is a bill that is a bipartisan bill. It's actually led by a Republican from Texas named Will Hurd uh, and a Democrat from California named Pete Aguilar um, called the USA Act. And that bill tries to address some of the concerns the president has raised in, I think, a pretty thoughtful way. It says, let's address the issue of border security, security by doing a mile-by-mile -mile assessment of the southern border. And in some instances, um, that may require uh, fencing or barrier. And in those instances, you have to be able to justify it, that that is the best way to do it. In other areas, it may require technology, things like sensor technology or the use of drone technology. In some instances, it may be trying to plus up uh, um, human beings at the border. We have actually 3,000 vacancies in Customs and Border Patrol right now that should be filled. And so part of the USA Act said, let's make sure that we're taking a strategic approach to addressing the concerns at the border. In addition, uh, that bill proposes some other things as well. It proposes substantially increasing the number of immigration judges uh, because part of the problem we've seen is there simply aren't enough immigration judges processing cases when people present themselves at the southern border seeking asylum. On top of that, it proposes uh, 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 trying to deal with some of the causes of the migration to our southern border in the first place, using the State Department funds to try to create more stability in Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador and try to reduce some of the, uh, the gang violence and the cartel activity that's driving people to come here in the first place. And finally, what that bill proposes is trying to provide some certainty for DREAMers and DACA recipients. These are young people who are brought to our country through no choice of their own, through no fault of their own, and it tries to provide them with some certainty. I think that's a pretty thoughtful way of addressing this, and my hope is now that the government is reopened and we have this three-week period where Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate can negotiate on these border security issues, that seems to me to be a potential path forward uh, for, for landing this plan. So now I'm going to suggest you jump about three slides forward. Keep going. Keep going. Skip that one. There we go. Um, the other uh, thing that I think is important is to stop this from happening again. Again, I think government shutdowns are a really bad idea. And I'm against shutting down the government for any policy reason. Really, for any policy reason. I think it was a bad idea to shut down the government for a border wall. I think it was a bad idea five years ago to shut down the government when folks wanted to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I think just generally it's, it's, it's sort of bad practice to say in hopes of having some policy outcome where we're just going to stop paying people and stop providing critical services. Um, beyond that, I've supported uh, some reforms to try to discourage government shutdown. So I've been a sponsor of a bill called No Budget, No Pay that says if, if members of Congress don't do their job in passing the budget, they shouldn't get paid. I've pushed for legislation that says no budget, no recess, which means that if uh, members of Congress don't get budget, they should be able to go home. And beyond that, we've looked at things like um, potentially, and I think one of the, this could come up over these next three weeks, is trying to have some sort of a backstop so at the very least you just maintain last year's funding rather than having the lights go out and people not getting paid. So stay tuned for that. I think you're seeing Democrats and Republicans suggest that there's a smarter way to move forward than to have uh, shutdowns and chaos. So go ahead and move to the next where slide. Where find the sign? I don't know. I don't know where they find the sign. Beyond the broken budget process, um, more needs to be done to fix our political system. There's too much money in politics, which what this slide shows is just how much money has um, flooded into our political system, and that's an, enorm an enormous problem. If we move to the next slide, um, I've sponsored a whole bunch of bills on this front. I'm not going to talk through all of these, but if you saw that last slide, you saw a particular spike just a few years ago, and that coincided with a Supreme Court decision called the Citizens United decision. I will tell you, I do not believe that money is speech. I do not believe that corporations are people. 
And uh, I, uh, so I'm the sponsor of, uh, of a constitutional amendment to try to unwind that decision. The Disclose Act is a bill that says at the very least, uh, those who seek to influence our elections should have to put their name on it, that we as citizens should have a right to know who's trying to influence our elections. Um, uh, another bill focuses on trying to drive small dollar citizen financed elections rather than having all these special interests and super PACs and that type of thing. I want to just quickly touch on these bottom two. The FEC, FEC stands for Federal Election Commission. Uh, the Federal Election Commi Commission is meant to be the referee to blow the whistle on political campaigns and then political candidates that cheat. And it worked for quite some time, and then in recent years, the FEC has become almost as dysfunctional as Congress. And um, so I've sponsored a bill to, uh, to try to reform that and to try to get our referee back on the field to blow the whistle. And then finally, the Honest Ads Act is a bill that says that um, political spending uh, should have the same re disclosure requirements if it happens online as it does if it happens on TV and radio, because we've seen more and more political spending go into the online arena, and unfortunately there are not disclosure requirements, and as we've seen, there are some actors, including foreign actors, that seek to influence our elections in the online arena. So go ahead and flip to the next page. Maybe. Nope. I mean, other than that, it's really going like clockwork, you guys. Can you try to figure it out? <laughs> no, not working? Oh, there we go. Look at that. Um, you are going to hear, now that the government shutdown is over, uh, you'll hear a lot in the next few weeks about something called HR1, which is broadly a democracy reform bill. It deals with all of those campaign finance bills that I just talked about, but beyond that, it does some other things, too. It focuses on strengthening ethics laws, both within the legislative branch and within the executive branch. It focuses on trying to protect voting rights uh, and to um, better encourage voting. And then three, it deals with the issue of partisan gerrymandering. How many of you have heard of the expression gerrymandering? Um, so I'll tell you what I believe. I think um, voters should choose their elected officials rather than elected officials choosing their voters. And one of the things uh, that is dealt with in HR 1 is to try to have a better and fairer approach to addressing the issue of partisan, uh, of, of how district boundaries are drawn. Um, I think we've seen far too much bickering and not enough problem solving in our nation's capital, and that's absolutely influenced how I approach this job. Um, I co-chair a group in Congress called the Bipartisan Working Group, which is a group of a dozen Democrats and a dozen Republicans who meet every week for breakfast uh, when, our, when we're in our nation's capital and try to figure out where we can find some common ground on issues, and I'm happy to talk some about that if folks want to. I also have participated in two um, bipartisan civility exchanges where we have uh, someone come to my district and I go to their district in a few weeks or in the next couple months I'm going to Arkansas uh, to visit one of my Republican colleagues' districts. And part of the rationale behind that is I think we get a better understanding of where people are coming from when we actually see where people are coming from and understand how their communities view issues better. I think we need to do a better job of that as a country. Just we're very divided right now. And I think trying to at least develop some common understanding is pretty important. And then finally, I was just named the chairman of a new committee in Congress called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Um, every basically two or three decades or so, Congress does this. It creates a committee to say, what's going well, what's going poorly, how do we make things function better? And uh, the last one was in uh, 1993, and at the beginning of this year, Congress established this new committee um, to try to think, make things work better. As you can imagine, I'm going to have my work cut out for me, you guys. Uh, I've had a lot of renovation projects over the Christmas holiday. I replaced the toilet in my daughter's bathroom, but this is a bigger renovation project than that even, I think. So, so let me talk, um, I talked a little bit about trying to fix our uh, broken politics. Let me quickly try to talk about fixing our economy too, and then I'll jump to your questions. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Whoop, hello. Too far. Well, it's possessed by the devil. Why don't I just talk about it? Um, 
So the slide that um, you can't see because it won't stay, there we go. Um, this shows that uh, unfortunately the middle class is really getting squeezed. We all know that there's been sustained um, economic growth now for several years. The uh, stock market's been going up and gross domestic product has been going up, but you know what hasn't been going up? Middle class people's incomes. Um, wages have still been pretty stagnant and as a share of overall wealth in our country, um, the middle class, uh, the share that, uh, that is sold by the middle class has actually been on a downward trajectory. And that's something I'm concerned about. If you go on to the next slide. Um, you know, I spent a decade working in economic development professionally. I wish I could tell you there was a silver bullet to economic growth and creating more economic opportunities for more people in more places. I don't think that's true. I think it's more like silver buckshot. There's a whole bunch of stuff we got to do on that front. And I'm working on a bunch on this front. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but let me just sort of talk about it, a, a few of these things. One, um, one of my big areas of focus is on uh, education and skills. Um, the superintendent mentioned, uh, you know, the school districts are working really hard, and I actually think the federal government needs to be a better partner to them. Uh, one of the big areas of opportunity is in career and technical education. Uh, I think for too long, the federal government kind of took its eye off that ball and didn't see the value of, of career and tech ed. Um, I think it's right. I've actually now visited more career and tech ed classes as your representatives than I have visited civics classes because I think it's important to tell high school students, hey, developing a skill is a good idea. Shop class is cool. You know, making it to graduation and being ready for a job, that has value. And I don't think elected officials or anybody else should diss that. Uh, at the same time, um, we know that um, uh, more jobs in the future are going to require at least some post-secondary education, maybe not a four-year degree or even a two-year degree, but um, a certification or something like that. So an, uh, another area of focus for me is trying to reduce student debt so that burden isn't borne uh, by students and their families. And then uh, I, I work a lot on infrastructure. I know it's the middle of the day on a Saturday, so um, I'm worried about talking too much about infrastructure and fear that you'll fall asleep. Infrastructure stems from the Latin word structure, meaning structure, and infra, meaning boring. Um, <laughs> but it actually really matters. We know that in the district that we all live in, uh, unfortunately, we're in the bottom 20% in the country when it comes to access to high-speed internet. Bottom 20%. Um, we know that when, uh, we, when we drive through Belfair or drive through Gorst, I'm pretty sure the speed limit signs are only there for nostalgic purposes. And so uh, transportation infrastructure really matters. Um, one of the things I've been working on is trying to secure some funding, if there is an infrastructure pack package, to support transportation in and around military bases, because a lot of the congestion we, we face um, is because we have this amazing employer in Kitsap County, the Navy, um, but it drives a fair amount of our congestion. Um, go ahead and flip to the next page. I'm not going to talk about all this stuff on the next page. I just want to give you a sense of some of the stuff that I'm working on, either as a lead sponsor or a co-sponsor. Not working. Oh, there we go. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of, uh, of uh, things that we can be doing to just try to create more economic opportunity for folks. But I'm, I'm and I, again, I'm happy to talk about any of these things for folks, but I, uh, I want to make sure I leave some time for your questions. So um, let me end with just a few public service announcements. Um, uh, we, uh, I mentioned we have some members of my team here. About half of my team here in the district does what we call casework, where if someone has an issue with any federal agency, we go to work on your behalf. Um, Chantelle works in our Bremerton office. She's standing in the doorway. Um, and, uh, you know, they really do amazing work. If you've got an issue with the IRS or Social Security or immigration, most commonly in our district, it's the VA. Um, we had a guy who reached out to our office a few years ago. He said, you know what, I fought in the Vietnam War. I got shot up on a mission. I never got my Purple Heart. And he said, I'd really like to do that. It helped me get some closure. And part of the issue was he um, got shot up in Laos, and he said, according to the federal government, we were never in Laos. And we worked with that guy, and we got his mission declassified, and probably the coolest day I've had in this job was getting a pit of purple heart to that guy's chest. And I tell you that because we can't solve problems we don't know about. So if you or someone you know has an issue, frankly, with any federal agency, just give us a holler. 
I um, also want to just put in a quick pitch for uh, our email newsletter. Uh, if you don't get it, we've got an opportunity to sign up for it uh, on your way out. And with that, I'm happy to. Okay. okay. So I'm happy to take your questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Slide says question S, which I I promise you all of that formatting was okay on our computer. But, Mr. Kilmer, but I'm still grateful to the high school for hosting us. <laughs> Mr. Kilmer, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the fact that they're using such a beautiful facility to do this. Yeah, for sure. But uh, what is going on with Miss Pelosi? Now it is it was on Facebook that while Congress and the House was shut down, she's on a jump into Afghanistan on our dollars. So, uh, I, there, there wasn't in the end an overseas trip either by the Speaker or by anybody else in part because the uh, President canceled the military aircraft. Um, periodically, and I'm a, uh, now a member of the Defense Appropriations Committee, periodically, uh, you'll have members of Congress as part of their oversight duty um, go and visit primarily war zones um, to meet with the troops to see the facts on the ground. That's part of a functional oversight that you should expect in our system of checks and balances. Um, uh, I have, a few years ago, uh, went to Afghanistan. It was a, a mind-blowing experience just to see, one, just how incredibly professional um, and terrific our service members are. Um, and two, the very difficult conditions that they're presented with uh, in a very tough part of the world. Oh, thank you. Derek, uh, two quick questions. Sure. What can we as individuals do over the next three weeks to influence the outcome of the, what, the negotiations? Yeah. And secondly, without funding the 5.7 for the border wall, will the president ever sign this? Uh, it's I'm sorry, 5.7 billion. Billion, yeah. Um, so let me try to hit on both of your questions. One, if you have a, a preferred outcome for this, to me one of the most important outcomes is don't shut down the government again. Um, I think it's very important for the American people to say to every elected official, House, Senate, White House, don't shut down the government. It's a really bad idea. Uh, and I think that message needs to be conveyed um, because uh, you know, candidly, I think part of the reason the shutdown ended was because um, uh, people started hearing from the American public. Uh, I'm a big believer in what Lincoln said. Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. And where the American public weighs in, uh, that can have a lot of influence. Um, hard to predict exactly what the, uh, um, where the president will land on whatever uh, happens in, uh, in these next three weeks. Uh, here's what I will say, though. Uh, I, I actually think it represents some progress that he's stepped away from the notion of a uh, $25 billion concrete barrier from sea to shining sea. What Homeland Security expert tell, experts tell us is that's not, um, that's not the highest and best use of money. That's not the most effective way of addressing border security. And in his remarks yesterday, the president acknowledged that and said that's not what we're going to be uh, proposing. Um, he referred to something that is referred to in the USA Act, which is smart wall, which is in some areas may be barrier or fencing, in some areas may be technology and sensors and human beings. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's progress that he's uh, acknowledging uh, that and has sort of backed off the, uh, you know, sort of wall from sea to shining sea. What that means for the next three weeks, uh, unclear. What happens now is there will be what's called a conference committee, where it will be House and Senate members, Democrats and Republicans, trying to negotiate an outcome. And I think there, you know, as I mentioned in speaking about the USA Act, I think there's um, common ground to be had on issues of border security. Frankly, the thing that hasn't gotten enough attention is the fact that there needs to be substantial investment in our ports of entry. The reality is, and I heard the President's remarks yesterday, uh, uh, he, reference concerns about um, drugs coming into the country. I share that concern. I, I, I think that is a legitimate concern. Now, here's what we know, though. More than 90% of the drugs that have been um, uh, uh, inter uh, interdicted in coming into our country um, have been found at the ports of entry 
um, not in the sort of ungoverned areas with folks bringing things across the desert or something like that. And we know that there are advances in technology that can screen, better screen every vehicle, every semi, um, so that we know what's coming in. Uh, similarly, um, uh, he made reference to um, uh, terrorists uh, trying to come into the country. Now, here's what we know. There have been people who've been on the terrorist watch list uh, who've been uh, caught by Customs and Border Patrol. Um, the vast majority of them have been caught at our ports of entry, um, including our airports, for that matter. Uh, um, uh, only a fraction have been caught uh, coming across the border, and um, the majority of those, there's six times as many that were caught at the northern border, not at the southern border. And so, to me, it's important to acknowledge, and that's where, for example, those 3,000 unfilled Customs and Border Patrol positions, that's where that happens. So I think there's, again, uh, there's an opportunity to find some common ground if the focus is on solving a problem, not on just fulfilling a campaign promise or uh, speaking to bumper stickers. Hello. Thank Hello. you very much. I'm Kilmer. My name is Margaret Campbell, and my husband and I, my husband and I are um, relatively new residents of Great right. We moved here from the Washington, D.C. area. Uh -huh. I'm a proud retired federal employee. Uh -huh. My husband was a contractor for Customs and Border Protection. So uh -huh. uh, the former uh, lady's question was really important. Yeah. But, I want to kind of switch your fo the focus for a few minutes sure. and talk about one of your infrastructure goals. Yeah. And that would be the expansion of high-speed internet. Yeah. I want to speak to that for a few minutes and what it's like in Grapeview. Sure. So we live in a part of Grapeview, uh, East Stadium, Beach Road East, where we do not even have conventional cable. We have satellite. And um, if I run a small consulting business from my home, it's a significant barrier to that. I can't participate in video conferencing with colleagues around the country because I don't have enough grant bandwidth. Uh, it, if we have the maximum amount of data plan we can get from uh, via, via, via SAT Exceed, we have 50 gigabytes a month. We run out every month. We can't buy anymore. They don't have any more to buy. Um, it affects our ability to interact in terms of the internet. It shuts down. So accessing services, et cetera. And you know, we're we're economically comfortable. We worked hard all our lives, so we have good retirements. But there are so many people in this area who have disabilities, who are on very low incomes, who really are left behind. Now I'm aware that PUD3 has launched this um, fiber optic network and they have identified these fiber hoods across the county. There are something like 13 or 17, I may have the numbers wrong but most of Great Cube is not included. And this affects our young people, I want to speak to our young people too, who have potentials to have um, digital home-based businesses, etc. Uh, and they're precluded from that. We are 10 years behind, at least, urban areas. Our governor, Governor Inslee, recently called this a necessity, and I know he's proposed $25 million, which of course he acknowledges his job with the bucket. But, um, I really consider this to be part of what is contributing to the political divide in this country between urban and rural areas. People, it's not in their heads. People in rural areas are left behind. Uh, it's a matter of economic justice, social justice, and I really think that um, more attention needs to be paid. So the question is, I know it's one of your goals. I have your lovely brochure here, part of your economic plan. But how, what are you prepared to do to get more resources committed to this issue? That, it's such a good question. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, um, your assessment of the problem statement was really well put. Uh, the reality is, in the 21st century, this has become a, a, a basic utility, not unlike electricity was in the last century. And yet, for a lot of folks in our neck of the woods, we just don't have it, right? We don't, I mean, I mentioned, uh, we're in the bottom 20% of the country when it comes to access to high-speed internet, which is, when I tell folks back in DC, that blows their mind, because they say, well, wait a minute, aren't you near Microsoft and Amazon and all that stuff? And my answer is, well, pretty near, but not near enough. And um, 
And the consequence of this, uh, as you mentioned, uh, is there are a lot of ramifications of it from an uh, economic development standpoint. And I should have mentioned your county commissioner uh, is here, Randy Netherland. Thank you for being here, Randy. Um, I work a lot on economic development issues. This is a basic economic development tool, right? Our capacity to help small businesses and entrepreneurs um, either sell their products or engage with uh, others uh, uh, in commerce is really limited if you don't have internet access. A couple years back, I was out on the coast and I met with one of the tribal leaders. And I said, how's it going? He said, do you want the good news or the bad news? I said, tell me the good news. He said, every one of our high school seniors graduated this year. I said, that's great. I said, what's the bad news? He said, well, for the first time, the state of Washington is requiring our students to take one of the state mandated exams on the internet. He said, we don't have high speed internet. He said, we did a sample test. It's one of those where you answer 10 questions and then you click next page. He said, we timed it. It took a minute and 44 seconds to get to the next page. He said, so that's not going to work. So we're going to end up busing our kids to a school they've never been into, for some of our kids to a town they've never been in. And so I think it's important to acknowledge we're not talking about whether a kid can watch the latest season of Stranger Things on Netflix and see if the kids make it out of the upside down. We're talking about do you have educational opportunity? Do you have economic opportunity? So what do we do about it? There are some programs that, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I'm trying to drive some additional resources towards. Some of them are focused on K-12 schools and making sure that at least our schools have access to high-speed internet and then hopefully folks can, uh, uh, can leverage that. Uh, I've also sponsored a bill that's a bipartisan bill called the Broadband for All Act that would actually leverage the tax code as a way of closing that last mile or last few miles. And actually, we wrote the bill in partnership and with consultation from Mason PUD because um, they're interested in seeing more people have internet access. And as they work on these fiber goods, they saw it as something that could be a tool for, um, for communities or even just for neighborhoods to try to build out that last bit of, of capacity. I think that's something, particularly in, in based on the fact that it is a bipartisan bill, I think that's something we could get past in this Congress, and I'm sure I'm going to push for it. So, thanks, we're working on it. Hello, Representative Chiller. Hello. Welcome home. Thank you. Um, in the past, uh, you have uh, sponsored HJR 48, which is the We the People Amendment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to give big money on politics and say that money is not speech and corporations are not people. Um, will you commit to continuing to support that as it moves forward this session? Yeah, you bet. Um, I've sponsored that constitutional amendment in the past. I don't think it's been reintroduced yet in this Congress. Uh, if and when it does, I'll, I'll be co-sponsoring it. There's a component of it that's going to be part of that HR1 that I mentioned that tries to address the Citizens United decision, um, and, uh, and I'm sponsoring HR1. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Representative Kilmer. Uh, Beth Moon right here. Uh, with your work regarding, regarding campaign finance reform, yeah. um, you would be in favor of eliminating the practice of superdelegates, correct? Um, I, are you talking about super PACs or superdelegates? Superdelegates. Yeah, I, I'm, I generally think it's a bad idea to have superdelegates, yes. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, I'm not, I, I, actually, I'm against both, super PACs and superdelegates. <laughs> Yeah, so my understanding of what's going to happen, just so you know, and I, I have to be cautious about how I talk about this just because this is a this is an official side event, not a political event, but what the, what at least my understanding is what the Democratic Party is going to do is they'll continue to have elected officials and party leaders have access to attending the national convention. Um, in the presidential selection process, my understanding is what they've proposed is that Superdelegates or those elected officials or, and, or party leaders um, won't have a vote in the first round of balloting. And then if there's a second round of balloting, then they would have a vote. Um, that's my understanding. I, frankly, I, you know, I, I, I'm not crazy about the whole superdelegate thing in the first place. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
below my representative government. Um, I can't even really see it, but I trust you're back there. <laughs> so, right. Hi, my name is Dennis Rossman. I was uh, looking on the uh, internet. I do have internet access. I don't know how fast it is, but anyway, uh, you're probably familiar with the Simpson as Elliot of 1986. That doesn't work though. No. Okay, that was an act where we uh, gave amnesty to three million uh, people who entered without visa or, or any papers. And once that was done, we were supposed to solve the rest of the border security issues. Do you have any belief that if we do one, will it will it be accomplished the second this year? So the. Um let me tell you what I think the, the right answer is, and, um, and then it's hard to kind of predict what will, what will happen. There was a bill uh, a few years back that actually got, I think, 69 votes out of the U.S. Senate, um, and then never got a vote in the House. But it was a bill that was um, considered a comprehensive immigration reform bill. And what that bill did is it tried to acknowledge that immigration is very complicated, and you can't just sort of pull it one string. You have to try to address immigration in a more comprehensive way. And part of that is trying to reduce illegal immigration to make, by making um, legal immigration less of a broken process. So how did it work? Well, the, the um, initial focus of that bill was on uh, border security. Um, frankly, not just at our southern border, but also at our northern border and at our ports. If you, I represent, I think there's 19 ports in the 6th Congressional District, and if you talk to a lot of the, particularly the cargo ports, there's real concern, just from a homeland security standpoint, about who and what might be coming in through those ports of entry. And so that bill made substantial investment in trying to address that border security issue. The second thing it did is it focused on, um, on uh, immigration's role in our economy. And it did that in a few ways. Uh, in part, it did it by um, trying to level the playing field so that employers that were playing by the rules weren't put at a disadvantage against those who weren't playing by the rules. So, for example, uh, uh, it suggested that um, it would use uh, uh, resources like E-Verify so that um, when someone was uh, hired that uh, there was certainty about their legal status. It also tried to reform how certain industries engage with the immigration system. So, for example, we know that in the agriculture arena, uh, oftentimes um, they use uh, migrant labor. Um, and in the high skills area, uh, companies like Microsoft and Amazon will get H-1B visas. In that regard, it did something I actually thought was pretty smart. What it said was, that is a near-term problem. We have some uh, positions in our economy where we, uh, where employers have a hard time filling those positions. So what they suggested was, um, um, just on a short-term basis, increasing the number of those H-1B visas, but jacking up the fees associated with getting an H-1B visa and plowing all those new dollars into science, technology, engineering, and math education for American kids. So that over the midterm and over the long term, those jobs could be filled by our kids. Um, which I actually think makes a lot of sense. The other thing that that bipartisan bill did um, uh, focused on the 11 to 12 million people who are in our country who currently lack legal status. And what it suggested was trying to create a pathway initially to legal status and then allowing people to go to the back of the line and work their way through the immigration system, but only if they've passed a criminal background check, paid back taxes, fines and penalties, uh, learned English, and again, went to the back line and worked their way through the process. Now that's a bill that got 69, I think 69 votes out of the U.S. Senate. It was a bipartisan bill. Um, my sense is if it had been brought forward for a vote in the House, it would pass. Um, and I think that represents a pretty thoughtful approach to comprehensively addressing our immigration challenges. I'm not sure that's going to pass in, in this Congress. I think what's more likely is something like the USA Act which takes a, a narrower approach, not just in terms of uh, the border security challenges, but also it doesn't really address some of those um, employment uh, uh, pieces. And in terms of the folks who are in our country who currently lack legal status, that bill only addresses uh, the dreamers or the DACA recipients. But, so we'll see what happens. But my general predisposition is to focus on a comprehensive approach to immigration. 
Dr. Don LaPera, Chad Benson, and Belfair. For those of who have listened in the other Washington, nobody won, everybody lost. I'm with you. I think there's, you know, I think part of the reason the American people are justifiably frustrated is, to me, this is not a game to be won. These are problems to be solved. You know, the vast majority, I've been all over this district, in fact, um, just in the last week I've been into it. Thank you. I, that's helpful. Thank you. I like to be able to see who I'm talking to. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, I've been all over the place. I was in Westport and uh, Tahola and Aberdeen uh, yesterday. And I did not talk to a single person who cares a lick about whether you get more Democratic or more Republican or more to the left or more to the right. I just want to stop moving backwards and start moving forward. And I think that, that's what needs to be the focus of our elected officials, not the partisan poll. Because I think we get so wrapped around the axle on the left, right, Democrat, Republican stuff, we're not moving backward as a country. And as and to your point, nobody wins when that happens. They need to understand that we're there in Florida. Sorry, I want to make sure we get to people. First of all, I want to thank you for standing firm in helping our government back, getting back on track. Climate change activists, yeah. and one of the things that we're facing in the sixth district is <coughs> the immediate crisis of the ocean temperatures rising, yeah. the oceans themselves rising, and I want to know if you would help us by sponsoring the Green New Deal, which would address those issues, plus put many more people to work in helping address the climate crisis, crisis that we're in. Thanks for the question. Let me start by just, uh, I think you undersold the problem. The problem's actually far worse than, you know, we're, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change in the region that I represent. Um, I was in Tahola yesterday, which is the lower reservation of the Quinault Indian Nation. Uh, the Quinault is one of four tribes I represent that as we sit in this auditorium are in the process of trying to move to higher ground because of persistent flooding from rising sea levels, more severe storms, not to mention the threat of tsunami. Uh, we've seen uh, more severe wildfires on the peninsula. Heck, we had a fire that burned for weeks in the rainforest. Um, uh, the largest employer in my district is the United States military. The Dep Defense Department refers to climate change as a threat multiplier because it creates tremendous instability in our nation, not to mention the fact that we have a bunch of naval bases, to your point, that are on the water, um, uh, that are along the, along the coast, on the shore. And uh, that creates a lot of uh, concern for our Defense Department. Uh, in our region, there are 3,200 people in the district I represent who have jobs tied to shellfish growing. Um, we are already seeing changing ocean chemistry that is impacting our shellfish growers. Uh, that is a real concern. And so I think um, for too long, you've seen folks in our nation's capital sort of kowtow to special interests and fail to acknowledge what I think is clear, and that is climate change is real, and we need to do something about it. And in that regard, uh, and in that regard, to me, you need to, again, not to echo what I just said about immigration, but to me, you need to have a comprehensive approach to addressing that. Uh, in my view, that, that involves a whole bunch of things, and you can call it whatever you want to call it, but let me tell you some of the levers I think we need to pull. Uh, one of those levers is trying to reduce our use of fossil fuels as a nation, um, both by trying to reduce carbon emissions in the first place and by trying to move toward more renewable sources of energy. Um, Unfortunately, in recent years, we've seen uh, folks in D.C. move in the wrong direction on that front. Uh, the Obama administration had something called the Clean Power Plan, which was repealed by the Trump administration. You've seen a move to try to reduce emissions out of tailpipes, which are a significant uh, contributor to uh, carbon emissions. Uh, that was unwound by the Trump administration, and I think that's movement in the wrong direction. Uh, I support what the Obama administration had done, both with regard to the Clean Power Plan and trying to improve fuel efficiency standards and reduce uh, emissions coming out of our tailpipes. So that's, that needs to be uh, part of the equation. 
part of the equation needs to be uh, doing what a, lot, a bunch of other countries have figured out, which is that when we make investments in a smarter power grid, when we make investments in renewable energy, um, there's jobs tied to that. There's real opportunity there. We can employ people. And in fact, we've seen a substantial growth in this state uh, in things like uh, solar production and solar installation. And um, so I think that needs to be a piece of the puzzle. Um, I, I mentioned briefly infrastructure. If Congress takes action, and I hope it does on an infrastructure proposal, I'd like to see part of that be focused on renewable energy and on uh, and on modernizing the, the power grid so that we're addressing some of these issues that are contributing to, uh, to climate change on the front end. On top of that, part of the discussion needs to be making sure that we're taking care of working people who might currently work in an incumbent industry that could be affected by our attempts to reduce carbon emissions. So um, if someone works at a coal mine in West Virginia or someone works at, Al at Transalta, uh, uh, which was a uh, power plant um, here in our state that was coal powered, making sure that we're not just leaving folks high and dry, but providing them with opportunities to um, either enter one of these renewable energy fields or seek retraining. So we're, uh, we're taking care of folks um, who may be displaced by that. So there's a, you know, and there's other stuff I'm working on too. I've introduced a bill that's called the Ocean Acidification Innovation Act to try to put more research into trying to address this problem of ocean acidification. So there's a bunch of things that we, uh, that we need to do. To me, what's important is, I don't think you've seen a sufficient sense of urgency out of our nation's capital on this issue. Um, in fact, I, my first term, I served on the Science Committee, and we had three hearings uh, about the myth of climate change. And I remember thinking, like, is this for real? Right? Like, I mean, so you've primarily seen either inaction or uh, backward uh, uh, motion, and my hope is, and now with the change over in Congress, that that changes. Thank you. You bet. Hi, Congressman Hello. Kilmer. I already said thank you, but I wanted to say thank you again and just look. Um, my son uh, adopted from Haiti after the earthquake, and we had hired an attorney to help us get his citizenship, and our attorney filled out the papers wrong, and kind of dropped the ball, and was not helping. And um, I just happened to run into um, uh, Congressman Norm Dix, former Congressman Norm Dix, at the gym and said, could you help me? And he sent me to your office. And Sherry Wilmot Williams was amazing. And no one ever asked me about my political affiliation or anything else. They just said, this is what we do. You hire us. And it didn't cost us a penny. In fact, my son now has a citizenship. We just went back to Haiti over Christmas to see his alien father. For folks, if you can be our eyes and ears, if anybody uh, you run into uh, needs a hand, really with any federal agency, I hope you'll um, put them in touch with us. And I'm glad our office, I can't promise you we'll always get the outcome you want, but I can sure promise we'll try. Hi, I have a question about the bipartisan civility tour that you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Um, well, during the induction of the recent new representatives, there was a new female representative from Michigan, I believe, I can't pronounce her name, but she used some extremely foul language and was applauded by some of the other members, and I just wonder, should that woman be censured? Uh, what is the uh, House response to vocabulary like that? Is that something that the civility tour will address. I think it's really important that we dial down the toxicity in our politics and in our political dialogue. Um, and everybody owns that. There's uh, On both sides of the aisle, I think we need to kind of dial, dial it down. The approach I've taken is just one to try to model good behavior. Um, for those of you who get my email newsletter, when I, uh, you know, listen, if there's a gathering of five people or more in this region, usually I'm there. Um, usually with a working PowerPoint presentation. Um, but uh, I really try to be cautious uh, and conscious of the things that I say to make sure that I'm contributing in a positive way to the dialogue, not adding to that toxicity. Um, uh, and that's frankly not just because I owe that to you as my bosses, 
um, to do that. But I owe it to my kids. I got to be able to look at them in the eye and say, "No, I'm working actually to try to make this work better, not make it worse." And so. Um, I can tell you the words that were used by some of my colleagues are not words that I would use, and they're, um, I don't think that they contribute in a positive way to the civility, but I think it's so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. Uh, hello, Congressman. Uh, it is predicted that in the next give or take five years, we will have self-driving car, self cars and trucks. And when companies realize that they don't need sleep and can't join a union, the three million truck driving jobs in America will be automated away, just like the manufacturing jobs have in the Midwest. So what will it take for Congress to pay attention to these problems, and um, how do we stop them from happening? And if we can't, what do we do next? It's a super question. Um, you know, frankly, not just with regard to self-driving cars, but um, you know, listen, we've seen dramatic change in our economy already. I think about this from the standpoint of 145. Uh, and I think about it just where I've shopped over the course of my life. So I grew up in Port Angeles when I was a kid. My dad was a big photographer. Um, he loved going up into the Olympics and he'd take all sorts of pictures. But he would shop at Kids Camera on First Street in um, Port Angeles and he'd buy a bunch of Kodak supplies. So Kids Camera no longer exists. Kodak, at its high, employed 160,000 people in this country, and now employs 4% of that. Um, my first job was uh, at West Side Video in Port Angeles. So we used to have these things called video stores. <laughs> it's amazing to me. The, the words, be kind, please rewind, mean nothing to my daughters. <laughs> Because they live in this amazing on-demand world of, you know, iTunes and YouTube and on-demand and all the, you know, on-demand when you worked at a video store was pulling the video out of the return bin before it had gotten put back up on the shelf. That was about as on-demand as we got. Um, and so, you know, and, and so you've seen fundamental change. Even when my daughters were born, we um, go to the Methodist Church in Gig Harbor, and after church we would always go to um, the Borders Bookshop in Gig Harbor, and my wife and I would go drink coffee upstairs, and our kids would mess around in the book section. And sometimes we'd buy something, and sometimes we wouldn't, but, um, you know, at, at its height, there were 1,400 Borders Bookshops in this country, employed 34,000 people, and now there are zero, in part because, you know, you have Kindles and um, the capacity to access content in a fundamentally different way. And to your point, uh, that's just the beginning. We're going to see even further uh, impact on people um, uh, as we see further automation and uh, the advent and the further advent of artificial intelligence. So uh, the. The question you're asking, I think, is one of the most important questions we face and one that Congress, quite frankly, is not focused sufficiently on. Uh, my view is this. Uh, I think public policymakers have to think about what uh, resources and tools can be used to help people navigate that economic change rather than to be victims of it. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. And this is by no means a silver bullet, but we, I mean, I, we could literally spend two hours just talking about this subject. <coughs> and I got a cello concert to get to. Um, uh, so I've sponsored a bill called the, um, uh, the Skills Investment Act. And it establishes uh, something that, and I think this is pretty smart. Maybe afterwards you, we can talk about it and you can tell me if you think there's other things that we, that we should be doing. Um, the way the Skills Investment Act basically establishes something kind of like a 401k or a health savings account, uh, but for workforce investment. It would be optional and portable. An employee could pay in and the employer could pay in, and uh, both would see some tax benefit for the contribution. And someone who's in a job where technology may be changing the nature of their job, could use their, um, uh, what, we, what we call as a lifelong learning account, is what we're calling it. They could use their lifelong learning account to go get a new certification or go learn a new skill. If they got laid off, they could use that lifelong learning account to go get retrained. 
And again, the idea is, how do you empower people? In you know, the days, my, you know, my dad was in the same occupation for 50 years. He was a school teacher. Um, but it is increasingly uncommon for someone to be able to enter a profession and then stay in that profession for 50 years now, in part because we have fundamental economic change. And so, um, to me, uh, having tools like lifelong learning accounts or, uh, or other public policies that help people navigate that change, I think is really important. Hello, Congressman. A few minutes ago, uh, you were asked a question about um, renewable energy sources. In yeah. Washington State, we have, obviously, the Great Cooley Dam and uh, multiple wind farms and solar energy. But solar energy and wind farms in our state are not reliable enough to provide the energy we need for our grid. And hydroelectric dams, we have we've maxed out the number we can have in the country. Um, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on nuclear energy, as the Navy has currently found a way to reuse uranium that's been used before. Yeah. Um, I've been generally supportive of a kind of all of the above uh, approach to um, energy production, if it can be done in an environmentally responsible way um, and a scientifically proven way. Uh, Obviously, there have been past concerns about nuclear, but I think science has advanced uh, in some, to, to some extent. So um, I'm open, uh, open to that, but it has to be something that, um, uh, from the standpoint of, from a regulatory uh, standpoint, that we can look people in the eye and say, this is a safe, uh, this is a safe source of power. Yeah, I'm Bert Gerhardt from Belfort. Uh, the coal, coal power plants, Okay, we're phasing that out. Well, however, uh, we're trying to build ports to go ship the coal overseas. So we're not accomplishing anything on a global scale. Global warming is a global problem, not a United States problem. So we, 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 the same thing with recycling. We are conscious of what we want to recycle and recycle. We ship it to China and China burns it to dump. What do we accomplish? way we turn that into a question is I'll just end it with, don't you agree? And, uh, and then I'll say, yes. Uh, um, here's what I'll tell you. And your, your, your general point is a good one, which is um, we have to acknowledge that a lot of these environmental concerns are global concerns. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it to the gentleman's question, but to me, one of the um, real failings of the last few years was the United States removing itself from the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, that made us unique as a nation in not participating in what is a global problem. And I think that sends a bad message to the rest of the world, not just about our seriousness uh, uh, with regard to the issue of uh, climate change, um, but also as we try to get other nations to reduce their carbon footprint, um, I think we sort of lose the high ground on that. Hi, my name is Marty Mioni, and I'm a, I live in Port Orchard, and I'm a chronic pain patient. Yeah. And um, I agree, the opiate crisis is terrible, and I hate to see all these young people that are dying. Um, but um, they, there is another side <coughs> to the opiate crisis, and it has affected the chronic pain patient terribly. We are losing access to our pain meds, which give us a quality of life. CDC has a 90 MME, which is morphine equivalent, or milligrams morphine equivalent, and they won't rescind that, and their doctors are being arrested, um, and they're afraid to prescribe because they are afraid they're getting arrested. I have been forcibly tapered 25% of my pain meds. And there is another side to the opiate crisis. Is there anything you can do to help us? We really need your help. Can I ask you? I, I want to speak a little bit about this issue, but if if if, um, if you could give me some direction, what 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 do you think ought to be done on this front? I'm just we need to rescind the 90 mme guideline that the CDC has. Um, let me take a look at that. That's not something that I have a lot of familiarity with, but... Um, I have some literature that I dropped off to one of your assistants. Super. And, Great. oh, please read some of that. You and bet. I have a couple of our stories that um, what's happened to yeah. us. I did. You bet. Anything. Thank you for showing up, too. The, um, I'm, 
increasingly, and just this week, I did a Facebook Live town hall on uh, Wednesday night uh, and heard from a number of people who were uh, raising the concern. Um, uh, my general belief is that decisions about access to medication should be decisions made between a physician and the patient. Um, now, having said that, and I shared this with you, it sounds like you might have watched my comments on the Facebook Live Town Hall too, the, um, uh, I think a better job needs to be done of informing providers and patients about the addictive qualities of various medications because that is a legitimate concern. There are communities throughout the district I represent that have been really ravaged by uh, opioid addiction. On top of that, I think, um, and Congress actually, this is one of those things, thankfully, that Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate actually agreed on and made some progress on this last year, was to provide some additional funding to the Food and Drug Administration to do research and to look at alternatives to opioids in terms of managing pain. So that, I believe you, I believe you. about the New Democrat Coalition, yeah. uh, make us a little more familiar with that, and sure. can you tell us how that helps you best represent uh, citizens in the city state? Yeah, for sure. So the New Democrat Coalition is a, now a group of 101 uh, members of the Democratic Caucus, and it's called the New Democrat Coalition in part because it tries to look at, it's a coalition of folks who uh, try to look at old problems through a new lens. Uh, when it comes to our economy, it tries to look at sort of innovative solutions to trying to grow economic opportunity uh, for more people in more places. Um, we're sort of focused um, like a laser on economic opportunity. And when I say looking at things in sort of a new way, that means in part uh, um, not just uh, embracing the things that were poor, right? Uh, some of the historic kind of redistributive policies, on, you know, whether that be increasing the minimum wage or uh, the Paycheck Fairness Act, which I'm a sponsor of, but also looking at how do you actually uh, increase the size of the pie, not just the distribution of the pie, so that we actually see from that chart I showed before some additional opportunity for, for the middle class. Um, the other thing we focus on is trying to have uh, innovation when it comes to the government. You've seen kind of this historical uh, swing um, in our nation's capital with some folks who think every problem is called, caused by government and some folks who think that wherever there's a problem it can be solved by government. Uh, part of the approach of the New Democrat Coalition is to say let's have government work smarter, be more innovative, let's reform government to, uh, and reinvent government so that it can be innovative in addressing everything from infrastructure to broadband as we're talking about, um, to national security issues, to, uh, to any number of issues. And so um, I like that. I like that approach. I think that's a thoughtful approach. And I, I feel very grateful that my colleagues uh, uh, elected me to uh, be the lead of that coalition. Hey, Derek, a compliment uh, for you. There's something that, that just happened that a lot of people here don't know about that you were very instrumental in. Since the mid-50s, we've been talking about the Belford Bypass here. There's been a lot of different uh, comments that are made and even uh, a lot of different fights back and forth on trying to get it. There was a great event that happened several years ago that allowed us to get it uh, put into the gas tax. And people still didn't believe it was coming. I want to let you know that I even waited the same thing until the money started flowing. They just signed a contract for <coughs> some million dollars for the design of the Belford Bypass. Uh, so that money is now flowing. It's finally happening North Basin 1. But the thing is that people don't know is all politics being local, even when you're a congressman, we had a lot of local people 
elected officials that were not in favor of it. We needed something incredible to happen. We needed all of our other local officials to come together and create an organization called the West Side Alliance. These were mayors from Bremerton, Bainbridge Island, Paul, uh, Paulville, Port Orchard, uh, commissioners from Kitsap, Pierce, Mason County, Transits from the three counties, Economic Development Council from three counties. This is what brought together enough will and enough uh, support to get the bill for bypass. And the one who put together this organization that held together that whole time to bring it was Congressman Kilmer. Yeah, I appreciate your leadership in helping us get that done. Um, the other thing I'll mention, just because it's germane to what you just mentioned, the next big opportunity on this front is, um, this is a trivia question that maybe many of you in this room know, but when I'm outside of uh, North Mason, very few people do. Do you know what the largest industrial zone property that's undeveloped in Western Washington is? It's the Port of Bremerton. It's that area around the uh, Bremerton Airport. That area is zoned for 10,000 jobs. And it's about 9,700 jobs short of that right now. And uh, part of it is, to take uh, Commissioner Netherlands' point, um, the uh, uh, transportation access issues. Uh, the other thing that we've been working on in concert with the Mason County leadership and with the City of Bremerton leadership is that's an area that's zoned for industry but doesn't have industrial sewer capacity. And so looking at potentially extending the sewer line um, from North Mason up to the Port of Bremerton uh, is an avenue for um, trying to solve for that. So we've been looking at whether there's federal sources of funds, the states looking at potential sources of funds. But that's something that can actualize those job opportunities and mean that we're providing for kids here in, uh, in Belfair and throughout Mason County. It opens up the door of uh, economic opportunity. If we see more jobs there, it means that we don't have to worry about our main export being young people. If we can keep kids here, educate them here, and help them find a job here, we can continue to have a more vibrant community. Uh, Andy, I've lived here for over 20 years, and I'm concerned with what's going on with the Naval Hospital It seems like they are continuing to take service away from them. Uh, they're taking away the pain clinic. I waited a month for, I have chronic pain like this, maybe none of me does, and I waited a month for we see the back pain and get told we don't see back pain patients anymore. We can send you to the Vatican, which is fine. There's a statement after that that says, as we're winding things down here from the doctor. So, uh, and then an article came out in the, in the local military papers about <laughs> taking away 17,000 billets between the Air Force and the Navy, and I think some of the Army too, and yet they were going to make services better. But yet it's, it seems like they're taking away services and they're gearing up just to take more of the active duty instead of the also the retiring and the disabled. You know, those are you know, able to save the service in the area. Uh, uh, let me touch on that in a, a few ways. One, in terms of your specific uh, situation, if you, um, if you want to grab a card and reach out to our office, um, we can try to engage just from a casework standpoint to see what your options might, might be and can try to help with that. More broadly, uh, you have a legitimate concern, which is um, I'm very protective of the mission of the Naval Hospital and trying to preserve that and not see the erosion of services that are available uh, at the Naval Hospital. Um, frankly, not just, as you point out, for, uh, for active duty, but also for, for um, retirees and, uh, and others. In that regard, another priority for me is something that has taken far too long, uh, and that is the completion of a new community-based outpatient clinic uh, in Kitsap County. That's something that was in the works uh, years ago, and frankly, the VA um, uh, messed it up. Uh, from beginning to end, that's been a process that's been really um, broken. And as a consequence of that, uh, one, we've introduced legislation to try to prevent those sorts of delays from ever happening again. Um, because it doesn't do, I just fundamentally believe if you serve this country, we ought to have your back. And you should be able to get the resources and services that you need. Um, and being told to wait in line or being told that you have delays in getting, you know, again, you're not asking for anything you didn't already earn. And I think that's what 
bothers me about the delays we've seen with this community-based outpatient clinic. Now, the good news is it's finally under construction. Um, I may have a, a restraining order put out against me by the VA that I can um, grill a lot on this issue. But um, to me, getting this done is a really high priority because it's important that it can serve veterans like you. I'm really pleased that you have the, uh, the Congress going without pay option if they don't pass the budget. But in three weeks, this whole thing will come up again. Is there some provisio that can be added to that where the civilian workers would be the first to be protected instead of punished? Yeah, I, I think your, um, your point is a good one, which is unfortunately too often the uh, impacts of dysfunction in our nation, nation's capital uh, fall on people whose fault it is not. Right, and um, so uh, I wish I could tell you I had certainty that three weeks from now this won't happen again. I can tell you I think it would be absolutely stupid for it to happen again. Uh, it would be wrong-headed and really damaging for it to happen again, but I can't promise you um, because under the current um, approach uh, to avert a shutdown, a spending bill has to pass the House the Senate and be signed by the President. And any one of those steps could go haywire if one of those legislative bodies or the President says, I won't sign a bill if it doesn't include X, Y, or Z. Um, so that's, that's the concern. There's an idea that's been floating around that I think is nuts uh, and frankly may be a, a better backstop than having the government shut down. This gets a little bit wonky, so apologies and please stay with me but um there's something when it comes to budgeting and appropriations in washington dc called a continuing resolution and a continuing resolution is basically taking last year's spending and just continuing it forward until it's replaced by something else so some have started to propose and i know you know and i actually wrote an article in time magazine uh, last year called how to stop government shutdowns and it floated this as an idea of just having an automatic continuing resolution as a backstop if Congress and the President can't come together on a spending agreement. I don't think that's nuts. Um, there's a little bit of concern, and I share this concern, that if you do that, it, um, it, it may remove any incentive for Congress to pass a budget and a spending bill ever again. Um, uh, that there's some reasonable um, and legitimate reasons for cynicism uh, in that regard. But uh, what I don't want to just see is continued shutdowns like we just came out of. It was so damaging. I, I, you know, it just made me ill to talk to people who were so negatively impacted, and it wasn't their fault. I think I exhausted all of your questions. Um, so let me just say, um, uh, let me just say, let me just say a few things in closing. Um, one, if, uh, if there was a question we didn't get to that, or that you think of um, as you walk out, just pop me an email or give, give our office a call. Um, when you reach out to our office and give us your information, we get back to you. That's how this works. I work for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is thank you. Thanks for showing up. Thank You're you. automatically... Thank you. um, You're automatically unusual people that you're willing to give up your Saturday afternoon to hang out with your congressman, but um, I'm very grateful for that. I want to particularly um, say thank you to some of the young people who are here, including um, I hope if you take nothing more out of this than anything else, um, I hope you appreciate the fact that um, your voice matters in this, uh, in this process. And I say that to everybody here. I mean, frankly, um, uh, it, it can be hard to watch uh, government in action. That's both in action and in action. Um, but I'm not a genetically hopeful person. I actually think we can get this back on track. I still remember my first year in this job. I was at the uh, Armed Forces Day dinner in Bremerton. There was a very senior guy from the Navy there. And he said, how's it going back there? And I said, well, it feels a little bit like trying to turn a battleship. And he said, well, Derek, I used to captain a battleship. And he said, what I will tell you is targeted and strategic course correction over time 
can make a really big difference. And so what I can promise you is I'll keep pushing in that regard. And I hope you will too. All right, thanks everybody.